let me have an opening prayer as we uh, think about Scripture and how we can become better readers of the Apostle Paul's letters. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a very fine day. We thank you for blue skies and comfortable temperatures, for uh, produce in the land that's uh, growing abundantly. And yet, oh God, these good things are offset by uh, news of disasters in countries like Haiti where many have lost their life. When we think about Afghanistan and some of the fear that that country is going through. And so we pray that we may not be uh, ignorant about the concern and plight of others uh, who also are your image bearers. And may we also be more appreciative for the safety and abundance and freedom that is part of our life. So we thank you for these good gifts. We thank you now for the opportunity to think about your word in a more deeper and rich way. And we pray that your Holy Spirit, the same one who inspired Paul to write these letters years ago, will be present so that we may hear, that we may understand, and we may grow as your children and followers of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So last week, I introduced the theme. So just in case there are a few of you who were not here last week, so just to kind of bring you up to speed, but not so much so that those who were last week will, will feel uh, frustrated. I came with a kind of claim last week that the Apostle Paul is an extremely skilled letter writer who not only borrows habits from letter writing of that day, but he is not just a robot who blindly borrows. He's a very gifted writer who can edit, who can expand. And the result is an extremely powerful result. And this all happens, of course, under the leading and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we're using Philemon as a kind of test case because Philemon, out of Paul's letters, is the shortest, even though Actually, it's a smidgen longer than most letters of that day, but Philemon is uh, short and uh, therefore is a bit manageable for the brief time that we're looking at these letters. So last week, we observed, among other things, in addition to that big thesis, that Paul's letters have four parts. We probably aren't surprised there's an opening and a closing and a body, but last week, we, we had to add or expand our understanding. There was something between the opening and the body. Paul hasn't really begun the heart of the letter yet. And so last week we looked at the opening, Thanksgiving. This week we get to that so-called meat and potatoes part, the, 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 the key part of the letter. And I'll say some things about that. And then also the letter closing. And I'm pretty sure that I can do that relatively easily within the hour, which will mean that there is maybe a little more time for a question or two or three uh, and so think about that as we walk through this material, and we hope to do that at the end. So here we go. So we're going to think for a little bit about the letter body. Now, the letter body is, first of all, a little different than the other parts, obviously, because this is fairly formulaic, you know, formulaic, right, where you do the same thing over again, and also the closing. But every, bon every one of Paul's letter bodies are different, because to one church, Paul has to talk about this particular problem, and another church, another particular problem. So, so the letter body is a little more diverse than these other three things, but yet there are some elements in the body that happen with some frequency, and they have some connection with other letters of the day, and I want to highlight some of that for you. So here's the first thing that we can think about. And people like me, you know, us New Testament scholars, call this the appeal formula, all right? That's because Paul uses a special verb, and it can sometimes be translated appeal, it could be ask or urge, so different things in English, but it's the same Greek word. And first of all, let me just show you that it occurs a lot in Paul's letters. So first, I'll give you one text that you probably know, like Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. So this word over here, I appeal, right? That's a key verb used to introduce a request. And look at all these examples. Like Paul uses this a lot of times in his letters. And what won't be so obvious to you is, and here's a Scandinavian scholar, right, uh, who wrote his thesis in German, who, who looked at 
pagan letters, other letters of the day that use this special formula that we find in Paul's letters, and he noticed a couple of interesting things. I think they're interesting, and you probably will too. The Scandinavian scholar noted that if you were a government official, if you were a city leader, and you were writing a letter to an audience that was what? Not a hostile audience, a friendly audience, right? An audience that you could optimistically expect will listen and do what you say. He noted that you would deliberately not be heavy-handed and say something like, I, so-and-so, command you to do A, B, and C, right? But instead of insulting your audience by being so heavy-handed, you would use this, I'll say, more user-friendly way of speaking, I in English, it can be translated, I appeal. Some translations, I urge, I ask. And we can see that Paul knows the difference between commanding and, well, er, appealing. Because in, here, I just, maybe for a second, see this, this gun here, right? I mean, that's, that's when you're heavy-handed, right? I mean, let me give you an example. Imagine I went to my seminary students and I said, I, Jeffrey Wyman, as a professor of Calvin Theological Seminary, right, uh, who has the right and authority to flunk you in this class and ruin any chance of you being called to ministry, I command you to do A, B, and C. Ooh, that's pretty heavy-handed, right? I mean, that doesn't sound very good. Or the analogy is I'm putting a gun to a head, not literally, right, and you're forcing someone in a heavy hand to do that way. But instead, my students, you know, I don't want to insult them, and plus they're mostly motivated to do what I say, right? Just like Christians mostly are motivated, we hope, because they love God and what God has done for them in Christ and God's grace at working in them. And so Paul doesn't come to these Christians and put a gun to their head and say, I, Paul, an apostle, command you to do A, B, and C. Instead, Paul uses the I, Paul, right, urge you, ask you, appeal to you. And in Philemon, it's kind of interesting. Notice what Paul says. Whoops, went too far. So this is the first thing he says in the body of the letter, by the way. Although in Christ I could be bold and, do you see it right there? Command you to do what you ought to do. More because of love, I, there's that verb, right? That special verb. I appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ. I, oh, second time, appeal to you concerning my child to whom I have given birth in prison, Onesimus. By the way, remember, this little letter of Philemon is the rich Christian slave owner with the runaway slave Onesimus, just in case, you know, that's a little strange to you. But isn't this interesting? Paul contrasts what he could do, namely, be heavy-handed and command. Instead, he says, I'm instead appealing, not once, but twice. And so Paul has a good relationship with this rich Christian slave owner, and Paul expects this other person to hear what Paul says, right? And so Paul, again, doesn't insult his friend by saying, I command you, but instead I appeal to you. That's exactly right. And if I could pick on Pastor Scott, just because he's here, I mean, he doesn't typically come to the pulpit and say, I, right, heavy-handed command you to do so-and-so. Because, again, we don't want to force people, right, into good behavior, we hope and trust and pray that God's grace is so powerful, right, in our lives that it changes us, it, tr it transforms us so that we want to do these things. And so when pastors come, we, we instead typically, what, we ask you, we urge you, we appeal to you to do A, B, and C. Now, having said that, I don't know, do I have a slide here? No, I don't. But once in a while, uh, Paul writes to a church, and the first time he... User-friendly, he appeals to you to do A, B, and C. And then to the same church in a second letter, right, the situation is still there. He says, again, I appeal to you. But there's even a couple of cases, I could highlight one for you, where the situation doesn't get better. In fact, it even gets worse. And finally, Paul, out of maybe need, right, I mean, the situation is serious, not getting better. Then Paul will reach into his reservoir of choice of words, and he won't use the softer, friendly, I appeal to you, but the more heavy-handed, I command you, right? So, so keep an eye on that. Uh, some of you who are processing this, for instance, what is... What letter of Paul that he wrote to the church that he had the worst relationship with? Like the absolute worst relationship. What do you think? Which congregation was that? 
Galatians, exactly right. Actually, remember, it's more than one congregation, Galatians. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. Remember, oh, nincompoops, right? And so, and, and actually, Paul is in a vulnerable position because these churches, instead of listening to Paul, are listening to some other people who've come from the head boys in Jerusalem. So Paul's kind of behind the eight ball, and he's in trouble. And so in that letter... Paul is not writing to a friendly audience. Paul is writing to an audience that is already kind of rejecting him and buying into the teaching of other people. And so Paul doesn't use in Galatians, you understand that, right? You wouldn't find that nice, softer, user-friendly language in Galatians because that doesn't fit what's going on in that particular letter. Well, there are other things that Paul does to be persuasive in his letters, and this is kind of interesting from Philemon. Paul says to uh, Philemon, being such a person as Paul, now an old man and a prisoner of Christ Jesus, right? Now, I have said to you before, and I'm saying to you, Paul doesn't have a word count, right? It's not like a class assignment, and Paul says, you know, his teacher said, every letter has to have X number of words. So in other words, Paul isn't filling space. He's not just saying things for the sake of saying something. Paul always has a, a purpose in mind. And so you should ask yourself, why does Paul draw attention to the fact that he's an old man? And you say, well, maybe, well, maybe Philemon doesn't know how old he is. Although we might still say, why does Paul feel the need to let him know that? But actually, that's not the case. Because from later in the letter, we know very clearly that Paul, the apostle, has led the rich Christian slave owner, Philemon, to the faith, right? So, so they, I mean, that obviously would take time or some personal context. So they clearly know each other. So, so why does Paul remind a person he knows well, a person he led to Christ, how old he is? Remember last week I said, don't be the sleepy reader, right, where things in the text go over your head, but be the, what word? Very good. The alert reader. Right? Have, think about these things when you read the scriptures. There has to be a reason why he did that. And here's my proposal. In the ancient world, especially in the Middle East and the Far East, you were supposed to give what to older people? Respect. I know that doesn't sound very convincing here in North America, right? Because we don't, well, we don't typically respect old people. Right? Sometimes people around the world think we're pretty callous, right? We take our old people and we shove them into buildings right away from us. <laughs> they, they would never do that. I'll give you a little anecdote maybe to illustrate the point. So we have a lot of Korean students. They come from Korea and they study, you know, at Calvin Seminary for a short time, especially those who, who want to go into a PhD program in the States. They can't get in there directly, so they come to Calvin Seminary for like a one or two year degree, and then they go on. And I meet with these Korean students and This is a number of years ago. Remember, I've been teaching at Calvin for 29 years. So this is a long time ago when I was much younger, and I'm sitting in my office with this Korean student who just came from Korea, and out of the blue, I mean, he just, from my point of view at the time, I didn't know what was going on. He says, I know how old you are. I go, okay. (laughs) I mean, I, I, I didn't get it at the time, okay? But you have to realize that in Asian culture, Age is of huge, huge importance. And it so happened, because I was only 31 when I first started teaching, this Korean student was older than me. And he wanted to not so subtly let me know that he was older because, see, he was hoping, therefore, that I would maybe treat him better, right? Okay. And I didn't know that at the time. I only discovered that later, right, when I had more exposure with uh, Asian culture and I asked another Korean person whom I trusted, you know, what that was like. Although they told me it was still, they thought, inappropriate because in Korean circles, they're very hierarchical. And uh, frankly, you can't get any higher on the totem pole than a professor. Yeah, I mean, professor, I mean, student. So they still thought it was kind of, this is the honor-shame thing that we also don't get over here, right? So, uh, so I said, and, and there's text in the Bible too. I think I have it right over here, right? We have here, right? Stand up in the presence of the age, show respect for the elderly. So this is part of Paul's Old Testament. Here's a Sirach text. So this is a Jewish writing between the old and the new and insult no man when he is old. So I'm suggesting to you that 
that part of Paul's persuasive technique is to deliberately draw attention to his age, right? So that uh, not only is he an old man in prison or house arrest, you should feel sorry for me, but you would, you would honor me, right, by agreeing to my request. Here's a totally different kind of persuasive technique that's kind of cool. It involves a pun. Okay, pun, right? Making a play on words. So here in the body of the letter, verse 11, it says, formerly he, so he is the runaway slave. Formerly he was useless to you, but he has now been useful both to you and to me. Now, why is this a pun? Because in Greek, the word onesimus means to be useful. It is a rather common name to give to slaves because, of course, if you buy a slave and a slave works for you, you want them to be productive, right? You want them to be useful. And so uh, it looks like Paul here is cleverly making a play on his name. Now, now, again, if you doubt that that would happen, I have two kind of interesting modern examples where we do the same thing. So I'm going to give you the modern example, and then I'll backtrack and say, why might Paul do that? Or why might someone do that today? So over here, I'm sure you've all heard, this has been around for a long time, got the Got Milk commercials. You've heard that, right? Okay. So here we have a woman, and on the bottom, you can't maybe read it because you're too far back, it says, look close. Right there, it says, look close. And the word close is spelled not with a lowercase c, but a capital c, all right? So here's Got Milk, and there's a woman, and the, and the tagline at the bottom says, look close. Do you get the pun or not? No? Well, this woman isn't any old woman. This is a relatively famous actress by the name of Glenn Close. See, that's why the close over here is capitalized, right? Highlighting her, her name, right? So here's a modern, even today we make puns on names. Look close. If you're still dubious, here's another one, right? I'm sure you've heard of Michael J. Fox, right? And, and the ad is determined to out Fox. Parkinson. So here's a pun on his name because you probably know that Michael J. Fox has had Parkinson's for quite a, quite a while, right? And out Fox, right? That's his name, Fox, but they're using it as a verb, right? Determined to uh, be more tricky, you know, to overcome or something like that. So even today, we can make a pun on someone's name. Now, why would you do that? What do you gain by that? Well, one, it's it's a way of kind of impressing your audience, right? You look at that and go, oh, that's kind of clever. And you kind of smile. You're, you feel better about the person speaking, either because you're impressed that they could make such a pun or they made you smile or even laugh and that makes you kind of like them a little bit better. And what's more, it forces you to backtrack and, and slow down and relook at those words. You're like, like, wait a minute, determined to outfox, right? You slow down and I'd say, wait a minute, I'm focusing on that word because that's what's punning on here. Now, if you go back then to what Paul says in Philemon, so when Paul says there are two things, one, all right, at bare minimum, uh, maybe uh, Philemon, the rich Christian uh, slave owner, might, be, might smile or, or think, oh, Paul, that was kind of cute or impressive, right? So that might, that's a little, but maybe even more than that, because the pun is on the fact that he was useless to you then, but now he's useful both to me and you. Why? Because remember, Paul is in Rome. We talked about that before on one of the other weeks, right? When he reached into his pocket, remember some of you have been here, right? He pulled out his, not his United Explorer card, but wait a minute, which, he pulled out his citizenship card, right? That allowed him to go to Rome, and I said to you, once he was in Rome, he wasn't in jail, right? He wasn't like a, a common prisoner. No, he was a Roman citizen, and so he had to pay for it. He had to be in his own rented quarters. And so the end of Acts has Paul living in an apartment with under security, of course, and he can't go anywhere, but he's still carrying on ministry, right? People are coming to him from abroad, and he's writing out letters, and Paul is sending them. And, 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 and during this time, the slave, Onesimus, has been useful to Paul, right? So Paul is saying to the rich Christian slave owner, when he was with you, he was one thing, and now he's away from you, he's another thing. When he was with you, pun on his name, he was useless, and now with me, he's useful. 
full. And, and it forces you to slow down. And I hope you see what Paul has cleverly done here. Because naturally, the slave owner is going to be upset <laughs> with his runaway slave. And what Paul is doing is he's downplaying the loss that the master has had, right? In other words, when you had him around, he really wasn't that useful to you, right? I mean, I know, of course, of course, he's no use to you while he's gone. Well, actually, he is of use to you while he's gone. In fact, he's more used to you over here. Do you, well, let me say it this way. Is it easier to forgive someone who shafts you out of five bucks or someone who shafts you out of 5,000 bucks? I mean, maybe both are hard, but I would say to you, probably the one who did less, right? And so what Paul is kind of doing is downplaying the loss that the slave owner has had. He said, when he was with you, he wasn't that useful anyway, right? Oh, and by the way, you're actually getting a better return on your investment because with me, he's useful both to you and to me, right? He's serving you, right, in his ministry to me. So again, I don't know how that strikes you, and we'll see that in the question and answer, but I hope you're at least saying to yourself, man, I mean, this is not just something that Paul dashed off, right? You just don't quickly rip off this. I mean, this requires some care and precision. And a lot of us haven't been the, the alert reader. Some of these are hard to pick up, right? And that's why, well, that's why we have Bible teachers and preachers, right, to kind of highlight these things. Here's another example. Now, Paul never, ever in the letter says that the slave ran away from you. Instead, Paul says, he was separated from you. He was separated from you. Now, this might be a little technical, but I think you can handle it. So, this is the difference between the active voice and the passive voice. You can say the same thing using the active voice and then the passive voice. So, the active voice would be, Wyma teaches people at Caledonia Christian Reformed Church, right? Wyma's actively doing something, right? That's the active voice. I could say, I could put it in passive. The people at Caledonia Christian Reformed Church were taught by Wyma. Okay, same thing, active voice versus passive voice. Why am I talking about here? Paul says now, okay, this situation that we're talking about in this letter, this slave of yours that has run away, Paul says, he doesn't say actively, Onesimus ran away from you. It says passively, he was separate. Why is that significant? Because this is an interesting Old Testament way of speaking. You know, the Old Testament, uh, well, it's, it's true for New Testament Christians too, but we're not supposed to take the Lord's name in vain. That's right. And so when the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek, they took a lot of sayings where the Lord, Yahweh, right, actively did something, and then the Greek translators put it into the passive, but they omitted the name of the Lord. You can't take the Lord's name if you don't actually say it. In other words, with the passive, the implied person who's behind the scenes, the, the assumed agent is God. If I haven't lost you yet, let's go back to the sentence. He was separated from me. The text doesn't say who caused him to be separated, does it? And in a Jewish way of thinking, the unspoken agent is God. And I think what Paul is doing is he's trying to get the, the, the rich Christian to view this situation as all falling under, good Reformed theology, under the providence of God. What Paul is trying to say is, this running away of your slave, that didn't happen by accident or fluke chance. No, God was working behind the scenes. Uh, of course, a great example is uh, the story of Joseph, right? Joseph says to his brothers, remember his brothers, right, sold him, right? And later on, we have that, that's a pretty dramatic scene where Joseph reveals his identity. And the brothers, of course, are naturally upset because they're worried what's going to happen to them. But you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, right? And this is the Paul who, who has a very active, right, a very strong sense of God working things out. We talked about already in this too a couple of weeks that the book of Acts is not the Acts of the Apostles, but really the Acts of God or the Holy Spirit. So I thought this is kind of a clever thing that a number of commentators have, have noted, right? That it doesn't say 
It doesn't say Onesimus ran away from you <laughs> actively or something like that. It says passively, he was separated from you, implying that God has been at work. And by the way, that would be persuasive because what Paul is subtly saying, and Pastor Scott, maybe this is what you were hinting at, this, this is between persuasion and manipulation. But what Paul is suggesting is, if you don't listen to me, you're, you're, you're not just disagreeing with me, you're kind of going against what God has been ordaining in this whole situation, right? So that would be, that would be pretty strong and persuasive. Well, okay, last week we looked at the opening and the Thanksgiving. I gave you just a few little teasers. There's way, way more if I had time that we could talk about in the letter body. But I wanted to save some time for the last part, the letter closing. And if you're like most scholars... If you're like most preachers, you really don't give much thought to the letter closing. I call it the Rodney danger field of Paul's letters. It gets no respect. Some of you know about Roger Dangerfield, right? He had these jokes, right? He never gets any respect. So a lot of scholars tended to ignore the letter closing. They used to think of it, for instance, a little bit like we do. You get to the end of the letter, we just write sincerely, and then we're done, right? We don't give much thought to it, and there was this assumption that Paul, at the end of his letter, just kind of, you know, dashes off some traditional things. There's not much really important in there, and, and so they tended to ignore it. Um, actually, this is my PhD thesis right over here. It was later published, Neglected Endings, The Significance of the Falling Letter Closing, right? And so... Uh, Neglected endings because scholars tended to neglect what Paul said at the end. And in my uh, first book, uh, I, I argued that Paul is a very skilled letter writer <laughs> and he borrows from the way that other letters of that day end, but Paul is such a skilled letter writer that he can what? He can edit it, he can expand it, he can tweak it in a way that what? At bare minimum, echoes, echoes things that he said earlier in the letter. In other words, Paul is trying to draw on the conclusion, people back to what he said in the body of the letter. I try to do that with my prayers. I don't know if you ever noticed, I never say amen to my sermon because congregations are supposed to say that, but I do end in a prayer. And my prayer at the end of the message, I mean, it's a little bit like a what? It's meant for you to echo, to hear things that we had just finished talking about in the sermon itself, Right? I'm drawing to the key points in that prayer, hoping that the audience will go home thinking about those major things we talked about in the sermon itself. And the letter ending, Paul does kind of the same thing. He doesn't just sign off sincerely yours. No, he's got a lot of interesting things in here. And in some letters, he really is, um, maybe he, he, he spends a bit of work, you know, like he has one last shot at them, you know, and, and, he, and he summarizes or he at least echoes key ideas, what he said earlier. And you can see that in Philemon. As short as Philemon is, there are a lot of interesting things in the letter closing. Let's see what we got over here. Well, you can see all of these different things. Let's look at a couple of them, and I promise to give you some time to ask some questions. First of all, uh, the autograph. I think we mentioned before that writing a letter was not easy in the ancient world. You had to have materials. And... Often people wrote with the help of a secretary, yeah. The fancy word is an amanuensis. And Paul for sure used a secretary in six of his letters. How do I know that? Because in five of the letters, Paul says something like, I'm writing to you in my own hand, right? That's a signal, right? That, wait a minute, now a different person is writing, and this is very common in the ancient world. Usually writers didn't have to draw attention to it because there'd be a personal letter from me to you. And you'd look at that letter and you can see handwritten, suddenly the handwriting would change, right? So the very last line or two would be in a different handwriting and everyone knew, oh, that's where the author himself takes over and writes in their own hand. An autograph literally means to write it yourself. That doesn't mean you're signing your name. You're writing it yourself. And one other letter, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if we talked about that, but Romans, Romans 16, the end of the letter, you got all these greetings. And then suddenly the text says in chapter 16, verse 23, I believe, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. And you're like, what? I spent 16 chapters? I thought I was listening to Paul the whole time. Who is this Tertius guy, right? Well, Tertius is obviously the 
amanuensis, the secretary, and he apparently had freedom at the very, very end to have his own personal greeting. So what does Paul do in Philemon? Well, at the very end, he, he says, I'm going to write in my own hand. He says, do I have the text on here? Yeah, he says, I am writing to you with my own hand. I will pay it back. So, so if your runaway slave has cost you anything, Paul, is, it's kind of like an IOU, right? Paul is signing on the dotting line. Here's my signature promising that I'll make it up to you. And then Paul does something else that's, Pastor Scott, very heavy-handed. Not to mention you owe me your very... Self, okay, I just, that's what it says. Let me see here, I have a Not to mention you owe me your very self. So what is Paul referring to, you owe me your very self? Well, everyone agrees, it must refer to the fact that Paul led him to Christ, right? And so Paul is, well, sometimes in gambling terms, is, is, is pulling out a marker. <laughs> I shouldn't use gambling terms because I never gamble and it's bad. But anyway, you know, marker, this is like a, a, an ace in the hole. You know, he's got, and um, I'll give you an analogy. Let, let's imagine that uh, I have a seminary student, and uh, let's imagine I live here on Duncan Lake. That's not a hard stretch. And let's imagine in the fall time, it's time to take out my docs, and that's hard work, and I need some help. And, and so I'm going to ask a student to help me pull out my docs. But before I ask, oh, I ask him, but then I, I say to him, now, let's, well, maybe just give you four more details. So let's imagine I grew up in, in a place called Brockville, Ontario, Canada, right on the St. Lawrence River, which I did. And let's imagine that I was a lifeguard which I was, right? And let's imagine that, you know, this happens often, right? Mom takes Junior and Juniorette down to the beach and mom's like suntanning or looking the other way or reading her book and then Junior or Juniorette goes a little deep and I see little hands like that. By the way, people don't say help, help when they're drowning because their head's underwater, right? I see little hands like this and then I run in there and I, I saved him, right? And it just so happens that now like 19, 20, 21 years later, this person from my childhood comes to Calvin Seminary as one of my students, all right? So just imagine now I go to him and I would say, now, Fred, uh, would you be willing to help me next week take out my docs? And I don't want to mention to you that if it weren't for me, you'd still be at the bottom of the St. Lawrence River. I mean, that, that's pretty heavy handed, isn't it, right? So here, Paul is pulling out a big marker at the very end saying, uh, you know, spiritually speaking, right? I mean... Paul isn't talking about a financial debt here because Paul doesn't have a lot of money, right? The rich Christian owner does. He's talking about a spiritual debt. So that comment is not so innocent. I'm writing it with my own hand. I'm, it's an IOU. I'm going to sign on the dotted line. I'll pay it back. And what's more, <laughs> by the way, if you, I don't want to have to tell you that that's a very clever way of speaking because it allows you to, to say it, right? I do this with students all the time, right? I mean... I, mean, I could go to students and say, now, it's really important that you study hard for next week, Tuesday's test. And that's kind of insulting, right? As if they were babies and had to be reminded. I could say instead, now, I don't have to tell you, you know, how important it is to study, right? Did you catch that? There's a special name for that kind of speaking, right? Where you pretend to pass something by, but it allows you to still say it anyway. Here's something else in the letter closing that's kind of interesting. Um, this is the one I rendered last week. So maybe some of you, well, two things. Two things here in this command. Yes, brother, I do wish I may have some, this word here, benefit from you. So I could, I could translate, I do wish I may have some use, use from you and the Lord. This is the same Greek word from Onesimus' name again. So Paul again is playing off the pun of his name, Right? Uh, Paul says, I want to have from you now, not from your slave, but I want to have from you some use in the Lord. And then this refresh my heart in Christ. Do I have that on here again? I do. Those of you who were here last week, remember everything, I'm sure. So in the Thanksgiving section, at the beginning of the letter, remember Paul is pointing his hand up to heaven and saying, I give thanks to God because you do these good things. I give thanks to God because you do these good things. What's one of the good things that Paul says in the Thanksgiving section? I give thanks because you take the heart of Christians, and you refresh them. And then some of you remember, I said to you, the word heart there is a special word in Greek. It's not the cardia, it's the splankna, which means the, the guts, right? I said last week, right, we would say today, honey, I love you with all of my heart. Back then you'd say, honey, I love you with all of my guts. Yeah, because that's where the deepest emotions are here in the belly, in the belly. And so Paul says at the beginning of the letter, you take 
the guts of other Christians. You take the deepest emotions of other Christians and you refresh them, right? If they're feeling down or discouraged, you somehow do something that the deepest emotions encourages them and refreshes them. Yay, right? Then we get into the body of the letter and Paul finally, finally mentions the name of the slave, right? He holds it off as long as possible and finally mentions Onesimus. And he not so only says, oh, by the way, you know, Onesimus, he's my very heart. He's my very God. Now, in the end of the letter, again, not at all innocent, the very end of the letter, Paul has a simple command. He, he says, refresh, there it is, refresh my heart. Just think about it. I already told you who my heart is. My heart is your runaway slave. How can you refresh my heart? Well, you do what I'm asking you to do in this letter, namely to forgive him for what he's done. And some of you may remember, I think, also to turn around and send him back so he can continue to be of use for Paul in Rome. Here's, uh, this is kind of interesting too. Paul says, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. So let's imagine, uh, let's imagine my son Sam, okay, he's, uh, he's, it's a few years now because he's out of the house married, but let's imagine my son Sam, um, for some reason he's got two options, okay, he's got Saturday night, he's, he can do A or B, and I think B is something that he actually committed to doing first, okay, he had already agreed to help out, okay, someone, you know, on that Saturday, but then afterwards, he got an invitation to do something more fun that he really wanted to, to take instead, right? And then we know about that, and then what do we as parents do? We say, now Sam, you're getting older, right? Uh, and you're going to have to decide for yourself. And for a minute, Sam goes, yeah, I get to choose. I'm going to pick the one I want, right? But then we say something that he doesn't like to hear. We say, and mom and I are confident you're going to make the right choice. Did you catch that? Why is that? Because most of us want to live up to, again, the confidence that others have, right? And, and what Paul says at the end of the letter is, I'm confident of your, actually the word obedience is interesting, because you, you, you're only are obedient to things you have to do, not that you're optional in doing. So that's kind of interesting too. Paul says, I'm, I'm confident, you know, you're going to do the right thing. One last point, and then we'll see about questions. Well, maybe two. Well, this one's kind of interesting, too. One more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Yeah. Now, you, you don't know this guy, Jimmy Dunn, but he's like, he just died uh, like a year or two ago. He, he was like one of the top two or three New Testament scholars in the whole world. So he's like a really bright guy. Written lots of things, and wrote a commentary in Colossians and Philemon, and well, anyway, he, he looks at this verse and he says, this verse is a, quote, throw away remark given, quote, in the more relaxed mood of the conclusion. So this world-class scholar has an image of uh, Paul. I'm going to have to sit down, right? And, and Paul's at the end of the letter where everything is a little more relax. So I'm envisioning Paul. He's got his feet up, maybe a drink in his hand, right? And, and then Paul gives this, according to the scholar, this throwaway remark. Nothing important. Oh, by the way, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be delivered to you in answer to your prayers, okay? And I go, ah, right? He was the sleepy reader. It went right over his head. He wasn't alert. He missed something. The better way to see this is Paul, not so subtly, is saying, I'm going to come and See what you're going to, to do, right? Here's a good analogy. Remember, uh, let's imagine I'm over at Calvin Seminary and uh, we got Connor, right? Connor's over here, isn't he? Yeah, thank you, why people look. Yeah. So let's imagine Connor's over here and I see him in class and I say, Connor, what are you going to do this summer? And he says, well, I'm going to stick around here in uh, Caledonia and uh, Pastor Scott's got some vacation and uh, I'm going to fill in and preach for him a few times. And then I say something that every student hates me to say. I say, oh, how wonderful, right? Maybe you know I live right next door. I hope to come and hear you preach some Sunday, right? Students never, ever like me to say that to them. Never, ever. You understand why, right? Because that means I'm going to be there, and they feel the pressure, right? Because now I'll get to see whether they do what we talked about in class, whether they live up to the, okay? 
That's a better way to see what Paul is doing here in this supposedly throwaway remark given in the more relaxed mood of the conclusion. Well, I promise to be uh, short. The greetings are kind of interesting. Paul deliberately includes a lot of other people. So lots of people in Paul's situation know what Paul is doing and people, remember some of us know that the letter isn't addressed just to Philemon, but to Apphia, his wife, and to Archippus, the interim pastor, and the whole church. So everyone is aware of the situation and and that puts pressure on, uh, on the situation. So Paul has this little mark in 2 Corinthians. So writing to a Corinthian church that he did not have a good relationship with, even though he was there for a year and a half. Paul is kind of projecting himself in the mind of his opponents in Corinth. And Paul says, even my opponents admit that my letters are weighty and strong, right? In person, he's not much, his opponents say. But we do grudgingly say that his letters are pretty weighty and strong. And I hope that last week's presentation and this week's presentation has convinced you that Paul is, again, an extremely skilled letter writer, right? And uh, maybe we need to slow down and look more carefully at uh, the persuasive things that he does in the letter. So here we go. We have 15 minutes if we want. Lots of times for comments or questions. Right, so, um, so this argument carries more weight when you look at Paul's other letters, including the letter to Romans, right? So just to remind everyone, in chapter 16 of this long, long letter, there are a lot of greetings, 23 of them, if I'm not mistaken, at least in terms of people being greeted, 23 different people. And it's not just Scott, the names of the people, he gives them titles too, right? I mean, I mean, how many Priscilla's and Aquila's are there, right? Okay. But yet he says, not just Priscilla and Aquila, but who did so and so and so and so. And the first name, or I think the second name mentioned is, uh, Ep- what is this? I'm a little rusty on that. Who was the first convert in Asia? Do you see that there too? And so forth. So how should we think about this? Well, I, I, it's too negative, but, it, but the analogy will work. Paul is name dropping, I have to remind everyone that Romans is a little different than most of Paul's letters. It's one of only two letters he's writing to a church, what? That he didn't start. It's one of only two letters he's writing to a congregation that he didn't lead to Christ. Paul doesn't have any kind of history or relationship with these people. And in fact, it's even worse than that because Paul, a couple of times in the letter, not so suddenly says, you know, word on the street in Rome is that Paul's got some newfangled gospel that somehow was at odds with what the old time religion, you know, the good old scriptures had. And so Paul is writing not only to an unknown audience, but a somewhat skeptical audience. And so in the beginning of the letter, if we had to, Paul has the, the longest letter opening he has in any other letter. That's not by accident or fluke chance, but Paul is kind of introducing himself and winning over their trust and confidence, and Paul is similarly doing the same thing at the end of the letter, and, and it's not just the number of people, but it's, it's his connection with them. So who are Priscilla and Aquila? Well, Paul was a year and a half in Corinth, and Priscilla and Aquila were working with Paul. Right? So in other words, Paul celebrates Priscilla and Quilla, and Priscilla and Quilla, as the letters read, yeah, yeah, we were with Paul like a year and a half in Corinth, and he's good. I mean, we, we can vouch for him, right? And this Epinetus guy, who's the first convert, if you want any doubt about whether Paul's gospel is legit, I mean, he's a living, breathing, he, he's like, I owe Paul my, I mean, you know, it's because of him that I'm a Jesus follower. And so the greetings there are, another analogy would be, you know, political candidate, and then you have endorsed by, you know, you see that sometimes in a paper. These are only analogies, right? But 
it gets at the idea that I'm trying to say. Now, liberal scholars, they come to Romans 16 with all of these greetings and they go, that's weird, that can't be right. Paul was never in Rome and so he could never know all of these people. And so I think something fishy is going on here. I don't think that the ending of Romans was originally written to Romans. I think it must have been the ending of another letter to a place where he knew lots of people. And for some reason, we don't know why, but for some reason the ending of this other letter got chopped off and added to the ending of Romans. This kind of thing was said in the past. So, uh, again, I don't know if it bleeds over into the manipulation, but again, you and I, maybe as Christians, I mean, it's a good thing if we're willing to listen to Paul, right? I mean, maybe as Christians, we, we feel and we believe that, that Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul himself says in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, right, that You received our words not as the words of men, but as they truly are, the word of God. So that's a great posture to have. But it would be misleading if you think everyone in the early church said, yes, Paul, you the man, Paul. Just tell us the truth, Paul, right? We say, no, I mean, some churches he had good relationship with, and he didn't have to do this kind of introducing himself and winning them over, right? Because he led them to Christ. He had a good relationship with them. But other churches like Rome, right, he had never been there. I'm trying to get there, right? And not only did they not know him, they were a little suspicious about him. And what would be the use of Paul writing all of these chapters if he couldn't be sure if people would even trust in him or listen to him, you see? Here's another example. Um, This is the beginning of Romans, for instance. Let's imagine I was invited to come to Caledonia Christian Reformed Church, a nice conservative congregation. And I know that people over here are a little suspicious about any professor from Calvin Theological Seminary. Why? I can only be liberal. And so before I even come in the pulpit, I'm already thinking to myself, oh man, I'm kind of behind the eight ball. I mean, these people are doubtful about who I am. And so I say with deliberation, I don't think manipulation because it's true. I come to the pulpit and my first words are, brothers and sisters, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to whom I belong, body and soul, in life and in death. Stop. Did you see what I just did there? You didn't miss it, did you? I just quoted from the Heidelberg Catechism. I didn't tell you that, right? And what's more, I did it on purpose because you're saying to yourself, well, I came in here a little suspicious about this Wyma guy, but I mean, he just quoted the, he just quoted the catechism and over here, we love the catechism. And so I'm kind of surprised he even knows the catechism and even quoted it. So you see, you see what I'm, see what I'm saying, right? So in other words, a speaker will do those kind of things in order to build trust and confidence. Because otherwise, what's the use of me going on the rest of the service if the whole time you're sitting here like this and he can't have anything good to say. We can't trust him and so forth. So it's a good question. And uh, there are other things, of course, going on in the letter closing. Because I would argue if I had more time, or you can look at that first book, it's even in there, or even the more user-friendly Paul, the ancient letter writer, where Paul is echoing, he's summarizing some key things in the closing that look back earlier in the letter, right? So some of that's going on in, 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 in the letter closing too. So it's not, and, and by the way, let me, let me stress this too. Don't think of this as an ego thing. It's not like Paul wants everyone in Rome to know that he's the man. And, and No, 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 we said this before in one of these weeks. Paul knows that the message is intimately connected with the messenger, Right? They're, they're, they're like this. And so if there's any doubt or questions about the messenger, that would logically lead to questions about the message, right? And, and Paul is ever so concerned that no one has any reason to doubt his message, his gospel, right? And so he really, in certain cases, has to be at pains to make sure that there are no doubts, there are no unanswered questions about the messenger, him, because, not because of his ego, but therefore, there's no reason to doubt the veracity, the truth, the trustfulness of the message. Well, Pastor Scott has broken the ice, so who's going to be next? Oh, it's dangerous to put your hand up, even if you're, oh, she's something like this. We could have a question from someone younger. That would be great, but anyone. I must have said something that either was puzzling, questionable, offensive. 
Well, if not, then remember my motto is the longer I am, the better I'd better be. So we can end a couple minutes early. And I'll stick around in case you had a question. Or remember, you can email me, right, if you think it's a little sensitive and you're nervous about asking in front of everyone. So can I ask you to rise and uh, we'll close our time in prayer and we'll go on our way, maybe rejoicing if possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the scriptures and the way that you have revealed yourself to us in them. And we pray that we may be faithful readers of that word. And I thank you again for those who have come here tonight with that interest, with that goal in mind. And so may your spirit be at work in each of our hearts as we process some of these things. And may we read your word perhaps with a new eye to be the alert reader in which we can better appreciate what you led the Apostle Paul to say to your people then and there, and which we believe is a message that is still true for us here and now. So bless us on our homeward way, and may that spirit also give us power to be faithful followers of Christ in the week that lies ahead. And we ask this and thank this in his name. Amen.